Thank you, thank you. Well, what a joy to be here with you. Wow, it's always fun to come back and see what good things are happening. You all are much better looking than the students when I was here, you know? They just, I mean, the standards are just going up. The, the faculty, not so much, but you know, you guys, you're just great, so. Wow, well, I really appreciate, I don't know. Can, well, my marching orders is to, are to talk a little bit about some of the events that were part of the run-up to the French Revolution. And uh, although it may seem somewhat unexpected, I'd like to do that using as the vehicle for the conversation, the guy that I have pictured here, who some of you may recognize. Does anyone know? Any face recognition? Anybody in the room know who this good-looking guy is that's on the screen here? Nobody? Nobody recognizes. John Wesley. You ever heard of John Wesley? You may be thinking, what does he have to do with the French Revolution? More than you think. And so what I'd like to do is highlight something of his career, which was largely, of course, in England, but talk about what an important impact it had in England vis-a-vis -vis the French Revolution, which is also very much a part of our conversation. So that's where we're going. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Father, we're grateful to you that you have ordained the events of history to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are part of that history. And whether we have a name that someone will be talking about hundreds of years from now or not, we know that from your point of view, every one of us has an irreplaceable contribution to make to the things that you intend to accomplish. And we pray that we might be a bit encouraged and inspired by considering this unexpected but profoundly influential character, John Wesley. And for that, we give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. Second test. Does this work? Yes. Battle of Waterloo. Anybody heard of the Battle of Waterloo? All right. Well, that's uh, an important battle. It took place on June 18th. 1815, does anybody happen to know who won? I don't want the nation, I want the name of the commander of the forces that were victorious at the Battle of Waterloo. Yes, sir. That was such a brave guess. Yeah. Totally wrong. Does anybody else have, uh, sorry, thanks for playing, I appreciate that. Anybody else have an idea? Who? Okay, here we go, please. Yes. Very good. All right. This man's name was Arthur Wellesley. He was known as the Duke of Wellington. This may be a little easier. What's the name of the character that lost at the... Uh, okay, here we go. Napoleon, the bon, uh, Bonaparte. He had many titles. He actually invented a few for himself. His favorite one was King of the World, you know? <laughs> so, not overly modest, but had some great ambitions. And so it's these two characters now. You might say that England at the time had become Europe's hope. Napoleon was back, he'd been in exile for a while, now it seemed that on steroids he was coming back with a vengeance with the Grande Armée. Did I say that right, Mr. Something like that? We, oui. there we are. You know, this massive military machine, he was going to overrun Europe, and people were trembling in their boots, and the only hope that they possibly could think of that maybe this guy could be stopped was England. England represented something of the hope and the fear of Europe at the time was France. So England and France 
England, of course, from Europe's point of view, the good guys. Unless you were with Napoleon, England was your hope of rescue. France was the great threat. Well, some years later, a fellow by the name of wrote a book. You're going to fill in the blank in a minute. The first words of which were, it was the best of times. Who wrote the book that started with those famous words? Please, young lady. Charles Dickens is correct. What's the rest of that sentence? Do you know? Lovely blonde young lady who gave me the first half. What, what's the rest of it? Exactly. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The title of that book is what? What is it? Anybody shout it out. What is it? A Tale of Two Cities. One of those cities that was the best of times, one of those cities that was the worst of times. Dickens, writing later, was referring to an event that took place earlier in and around the French Revolution in which he was saying, it was for one city in Europe the best of times. That city would be what? London. It was for another city in Europe the worst of times. What city was that? Paris. So that kind of sets up not only a tale of two cities, but really a tale of two paths and a tale of two destinies for two different civilizations that in a sense met each other at Waterloo in a contest over just who was on the right path and who was pursuing the right destiny. It's easy to look at the circumstances of these nations at the time of the Battle of Waterloo and just assume that England had always been the good guys and France had always been the bad guys in terms of that conflict. What's a little surprising and not well known by a lot of folks is that if you could look at England and France maybe a few decades before they would be virtually indistinguishable both of them were heading down a path called totalitarianism. Now, that's a big word, so who wants to take a stab at that? If I use the term totalitarianism, what do I mean? Young man, please. I'm out of here. You come out. You can lecture, man. <laughs> the kids at the Oaks are smarter, too. I'm figuring that out, you know, <laughs> these days. Well, that's a very good. That's uh, exactly correct, and I hope you all caught that because that's precisely what totalitarianism is. It concentrates in the hands of either one or a very few virtually absolute control over the lives, the destinies, the work, the marriage, the living condition, the location, everything of all the folks that are in kind of the lower level of the society. It's also sometimes called absolutism. Now we know that France was on that path. However, what's less well known is that England was too. French totalitarianism you could call political. Oops, my clicker is overly ambitious. Back, there we are. Oops, okay. This guy is sometimes considered the inventor of French totalitarianism. He certainly brought it to its highest expression. I sort of gave you the answer inadvertently there. Who is this? Anybody know who I'm, who's pictured here? Yes. That's correct, Louis XIV. Louis XIV reigned from 1643 to 1717. He liked to sort of pass himself off to the French people as if he were God. So he dressed up in these rather lavish uh, kinds of gar garments, and that's the way he liked the people to see him. To me, he looks kind of like a plumber from Hilliard, but you know, <laughs> no offense to the folks from Hilliard in the room. You know, it's a great place, I love it. But uh, nevertheless, I just, I just, I don't know how he did it, but somehow he really 
establishes a principle of this absolutist rule. It's followed by his successor, Louis XV, who ruled for about 50 years. And then, of course, the next guy who was the heir to this absolutist philosophy, Louis XVI, who came to not such a pleasant end, as Mr. Stepper was just suggesting to you. Because in the middle of his rule, the French people had basically had it up to here with totalitarianism. Enough of this nonsense. And so, right in the middle of his rule, there was this major event called the French Revolution, uh, 1789. And as a result of that, the totalitarianism of these rulers in France was replaced, again, as Mr. Stepper was just suggesting to you, by what was viewed as a new and enlightened view of things. In fact, in some ways it was called the Enlightenment. Our new vision of how it is that we live out our lives and live in equality and fraternity and so on. How do we do this? And they said the answer was by putting in place of these absolute monarchs the goddess reason. And so they made famous an idea of worshiping reason. In fact, they took a woman, not any one of any particular repute, just a woman, and put a crown on her head, paraded her through the streets of France and said, here, French people, is your deity, reason, with a capital R, you know. And so it seemed as if there was the dawning of a new day. It seemed as if now things were going to become much better, but as a Matter of fact, the former totalitarianism was simply replaced with a new totalitarianism, which in this case was the totalitarianism of the mob, and it didn't take long for the weapon of mob rule to be as ghastly as anything those totalitarian rulers had been dispensing years earlier. And the guillotine, of course, becomes the great symbol of it. Mob rule, bloodshed, bloodbath, gratuitous executions, and it seemed as if there was nothing that was going to stop this, what was supposed to be new and enlightened age from self-destructing right before our eyes, and the people in a kind of desperation to find something to restore order, of course, virtually created a new totalitarian whose name happens to be Napoleon Bonaparte. So they never really escaped it. They thought they did, they tried to. But in fact, when the dust settled, the French were still as much under a totalitarian as they had ever been. It just went by a different name, different chapters, different stages along the way, but no real change. All right, so that is called political totalitarianism. England, interestingly, if you could jump in a time machine and go back and take a peek at France and take a peek at England, you would probably guess England was actually worse off, worse off than France. Now, many people don't know that because we tend to see England through the lens of what it became, not what it was. But if you could drop into merry old England in the early 1700s, you'd find what was basically a kind of economic totalitarianism. It had much the same impact on the people living under it. It just would go by a somewhat different name. The backbone of this economic totalitarianism rested on two pillars. One, slave trade. England had shipping all over the world. Ships were found everywhere in the world that flew under an English banner and they had people on them. The commodity was human beings that they snatched from one part of the planet and sold at great profit in other parts of the planet and huge revenue was flowing into the English economy based on an economic totalitarianism that was international, that was external. There was also an economic totalitarianism that was internal, driven by the engine of what's called the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution in itself was a good thing, but in England, 
it was given its most ugly expression because virtually 90% of the population was reduced to working in horrific conditions under the engine of the Industrial Revolution, mines, factories, mills, and so on, in which lives were short and miserable, and in which a few people were making a lot of money and basically dictating the terms in a totalitarian way of the rest of the population. And so you had, in some ways, England and France looked a lot alike. There was a radical division of the population between the two, a very few number of rich and a massive number of poor. And so again, you had a similarity between them. In France, the division was based on an agrarian kind of culture in which most people worked in a kind of peasant status on farms in France. The Industrial Revolution never got much traction in France, whereas in England, Massive numbers of people, no better off, but in this case they're working in the mines and the factories and the mills. Both countries by this time were suffering a dramatic loss of any significant or credible Christian influence. So that in England, you would, or in France I should say, you would see the um, Catholic Church was the dominant church appealing for the most part to the needs and the wants and the desires of the rich few, the nobility. In uh, England, it was the Anglican Church, which didn't look a lot different at that point, catering to the needs of the rich, the few in English society, none of them taking much of an interest in the needs of the poor. Well, I'd like to focus a little bit more on England for the moment and try to help us understand how it was that England, heading down a very similar track to the one that was true in France, nevertheless wound up going a very different direction. So, a famous philosopher named George Barclay was also a bishop of the Anglican Church, and he commenting on the state of affairs in England in the early 1700s said, that morality in Britain had collapsed, quote, to a degree that was never before known in any Christian country. England, like France, had basically embraced an Enlightenment influence, which repudiated the importance of God in the public square, which basically repudiated an idea of the Bible having any significant influence in the culture, replacing it with Enlightenment ideas that were virtually atheistic, skeptical about higher truth, cynical in many ways. That was swamping English society at this time, very much to the same degree that you would find it in French society. As a result of that, as you push God out the back door of a culture, you bring in the front door anarchy every day of the week. When you push God out of a culture, you bring in school shootings. When you push God out of a culture, you bring in violence and gratuitous expressions of pure hatred which have no rational explanation except hell. When you push God out of a culture, watch out. And that's what happens in a culture, whether it's the 1700s or the 2100s. You can't get rid of God and maintain sanity. Can't do it. And that was what was happening in England. So you had the rise of a kind of conspicuous social evil, the most prominent expression of which was slave trade. England had wrestled out of the hands of the French and the Spanish, had created a monopoly of slave trade so that basically the only game in town, the only game on planet Earth for trading and selling and making money off of slave trade was uh, based on the Treaty of Utrecht, which was in 1713. And there was an explosion, therefore, of English shipping around the world. John Newton, you may know his name, he was a slave trader before he became the author of Amazing Grace, you know, and there were hundreds of others who were involved in that occupation in England at that time. These boats were worse than sardines, packed together, 
hauling people. Many of them died en route, of course, but this was the nature of the biz. What you find is that slave trade breeds brutality, both in connection with those who are the slaves and in connection with those who are treating them as merchandise. The effect in England was to make the whole idea of labor undignified. Labor in England was for people who were in the lower echelons. England never had slavery per se in England, but they facilitated it around the rest of the world, including in the colonies, the American colonies. And it created an impression that if you're a laboring person, that you were virtually no better than a slave. And that tended to infect all of English society. So that in England, even though there was not slavery as such, there was kind of a de facto slavery that was organized around people who, for all intents and purposes, lived the lives of slaves, though technically they weren't. This is a picture of children. These people are younger than you who are in this room. What they did every day for 14 to 16 hours was work in mines and factories and mills. These were children who were essentially born into slavery, died in slavery in England. You wouldn't find things quite that bad in France at the time. It looked worse in terms of the English situation. Politics was affected by this because, of course, political power tends to follow the money. And so what begins to happen in political theory in England is you've got corruption, you've got bribery, dominating political life, the criminal justice system followed suit so that basically the laws of the land were designed to keep the few and rich in power and keep the rest of the society in a state of uh, virtual slavery. The criminal justice system was draconian to say the least, so that if you were someone in the lower classes and you were hungry and you committed some relatively minor crime, what we would call a misdemeanor, just to feed yourself, you know, you, uh, for example, uh, stole a sheep, snared a rabbit on somebody's property, broke a little tree in connection with doing that, picked a pocket, those were capital crimes. You were hung you see, for committing those. In fact, hangings were so common, they were called in England at the time hanging shows, in which not only men, but women and children were commonly hung, and it was entertainment for the people who were in another part of the social order. This was just essentially business as usual. Many others were shipped off to Australia, which was kind of a penal colony at the time for England. And uh, many others were uh, publicly punished. Women were commonly flogged in public. And this was life in England. Karl Marx showed up some years later and wrote a great defense of atheistic communism. A lot of the raw data he used to defend his theory of, of uh, politics was the data he gathered from earlier years in England. That's where he was doing his work in London at the time. And there was plenty of data for him to work with as he put together his Das Kapital. The mortality rate among children ran about 75%. That means if we were in England today, 75% of you wouldn't be here because most children didn't survive past 10 years old. They either died of accidents or in the horrific working conditions otherwise to which they were subjected, or they died simply by being left to die through exposure and even outright murder. They were otherwise abused, both physically and sexually and in every other way you can imagine. And there was no CPS then. There was no government agent you could call. No caseworker would come along. Nobody gave a rip. And that whole level of English society just simply lived in the most horrific conditions early 1700s. You were better off in France. Well. The entire English-speaking world, including the colonies, by the way, was influenced, but it was worse in England. And then something happened. Mid-1700s, something happened. I don't know, anyone could have quite seen it coming. It certainly took a lot of people by surprise. But it was the single thing that prevented England from going down the same path 
as France, so that nobody would have been calling England on the phone and saying, hey, come rescue us from Napoleon. They might, in fact, have been saying, somebody come rescue us from England, do you see? Because they both look pretty much the same, except something happened in England. A great reversal. All right. Somebody in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. Anyone want to take a stab? Mid-1700s England, what happened that changed the course of history for the English-speaking world for $64,000 on a free trip to Maui? Ah, whew. I was afraid I was going to have to call my wife and explain why I'm sending some kid to Maui with our retirement money, you know, but... Uh, no, not the American Revolution. It is what? You don't get the same deal, but it is? The First Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening. That's right. In my opinion, the only Great Awakening. But that's a different, different lecture. What happened? All right, when you think about the Great Awakening, you think about this spiritual renewal that took place. I tell you, not one of us in this room, including me, properly appreciates the proportions of the impact of the Great Awakening. We think we do, and we have some idea about it, but we would have to live there and experience it to really appreciate just what happened and how profoundly it changed everything. When we think about the Great Awakening, we think about three men. Now, of course, this is God's work in history, but humanly speaking, you would see three people, three men, who are largely responsible for it, if you just look at the human side of it. These three men were not military figures, they were not politicians, they didn't have any power the way this world measures power. In fact, the only power they had was the power of a book and a pulpit and preaching. And they changed the course of history. One of them, largely in America, anybody know who this good-looking guy is? Anybody recognize that? Who is that? Go ahead. You, right. That is Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, born 1703, died a relatively young man. 1750, what was it, 1758. The second one is this fellow. Anybody recognize this fellow? Who is this? Yes, go ahead. Good. That is George Whitfield. He was born about 10 years later. 1714, died in 1770. These two, Jonathan Edwards, of course, mostly in the colonies in America. George Whitfield, back and forth, 13 times, by the way, back and forth across the ocean, preaching both in England and in the colonies and many other places as well. And then the one we looked at earlier, John Wesley, born the same year as Jonathan Edwards, lived quite a bit longer to 1791, a couple of years past the French Revolution is when he died and it's John Wesley in particular that I'd like to have you think about. Nobody would have guessed when he was born that he was going to change the course of history. He was one of 19 kids. How do you have 19 kids? I don't know how you do that. That's a... He was one of 19 kids, born in very, very modest circumstances in England, to a town parson, you might say, in the Anglican church. He went to Oxford, he was bright enough to get in, and that was really his ticket to a better life. If you were smart enough, you could get into an elite school, and that would be a, uh, really a step toward a better life. And so he was planning to become a priest in the Anglican Church, and in the interest of getting some experience, he actually came over to the colonies. He was here in America during the colonial period for about a year. It was one of the hardest years of his life. He was deeply, deeply disillusioned, not only with ministry, but with his own competence to do it after a year of being completely underwhelmed at his ability to do this job. He got back on a boat heading back for England, really doing some soul searching, wondering if there was any prospect for him in ministry whatsoever. While he was on that boat, he came across some very odd people, Christian people known as Moravians. At the time, they were sort of like strange people that looked very different from the rest of us. If you ever seen folks like the Amish or something, that's kind of the way the Moravians were viewed. Nice folks, but really kind of weird. But nevertheless, John Wesley got to know them, and he was very impressed with the depth and the simplicity of their faith. The Moravians, if you don't know it, back to the time of John Huss, 
who was burned at the stake in 1415 at the Council of Constance as a piece of minor business in that conference of the Catholic Church. But John Huss, sometimes considered one of the pre-Reformation reformers, had preached a gospel that sounded a little bit like Martin Luther, who came a hundred years later, and the Moravians got their start during that time under the ministry of John Huss. And they continued to persist as an independent Christian movement even well after the Reformation, and so this is where uh, John Wesley ran into them. He was so impressed with the simplicity and the depth of their faith that actually when he got back to England, he went to a Moravian service, which again was a rather unusual thing for a guy who was a priest in the Anglican Church to do, but he went and he experienced something that gave rise to one of the most famous quotes in Christian history, which some of you have heard. Wesley wrote this in his journal, quote, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ. Christ died for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. I testified openly to what I now felt in my heart. And at that moment, John Wesley was a different man, and he wanted to preach what he had just experienced. But he found that while at first there were churches that would let him preach, he didn't have his own church at that point, Pretty soon they figured out that what he was preaching was really not something they wanted to hear, this kind of gospel stuff. Oh, well, come on, they, they, you know, that, we don't want to hear that. And so the doors to churches began closing on him fairly rapidly, and he found himself a man with a message, all dressed up and nowhere to go. He had this newfound faith in Christ, but no really opportunity to voice it to anyone. And it was at that time that he ran into his friend from Oxford, a guy named George Whitfield. And George Whitfield was also just back from the colonies. He had come back to do some fundraising because he wanted to build some orphanages because even in the colonies there was an orphan class that were the off-scourings of a, really the negative effects of English culture here in the colonies at that point. And he knew that there were these people in desperate need. And so George had come to raise some money and he got together with his friend John. They went to a Starbucks and were visiting and John says to him, you know, I, I feel like I've found faith in Christ. I feel like I, I have something to say now. I, I had three years at Oxford and I had nothing to say. Now I've got something to preach. But there's nowhere to preach it. And George Whitfield said, quote, dude, you need to figure out that the people who need to hear your message are not in those churches. They are the people who are working in the mines and the factories and the mills and the industrial regions of England who never go to church. There's no church there that cares about them. They never have an opportunity to have exposure to the truth of Christ that you have discovered. You need to go and preach, George Whitfield said, the term he used, open air. Open air. You need to go out into the wide open spaces and just start preaching in a public park, on a public street, and the people who are there will gather and listen to you. That's all that George Whitfield ever did. He always preached open air. George, uh, uh, John Wesley couldn't believe it. He wrote later in his journal, quote, I could scarce reconcile myself to this strange way of preaching in the fields of which he, Whitfield, had set me an example on Sunday. He preached and Wesley was there. Having been all my life till very recently so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it wasn't done in a church. What are you talking about? Preach in the open air? But Wesley watched Whitfield do it and decided he'd take a run at it. And on April 3rd, 1739, John Wesley preached his first open-air sermon, and history has never been the same. John Wesley went up and down England, Scotland, Ireland, other English-speaking parts of the world. He traveled a quarter of a million miles on horseback in all kinds of danger and weather over the years, preaching to people who never 
had an opportunity to have any kind of Christian ministry whatsoever in these lower classes, especially the industrial parts of England. He not only preached, but he also was a man of doing things of work. And so wherever he went, the so-called Methodist preaching houses were constructed. Preaching houses were places where you could go to hear the Word of God taught and preached, but also there were all kinds of services that were provided which were much more practical and kind of helped people in their immediate circumstances. So vocational training for the unemployed, no interest loans for the poor, free medical care, food and clothing for prisoners, uh, fuel and tools for uh, the elderly and the aged, all of these. And largely they were growing, they were, they were uh, being developed in these industrial areas where nobody really cared much for these folks. And this was kind of a change in the entire circumstance of life in England. You would think that uh, the English people would have welcomed Wesley with open arms and thought this is great, but actually he became public enemy number one. Many times when he was preaching, there would be riots that began to develop not far away. People would throw bricks and stones at him. Sometimes he got hit in the face by a projectile, would keep preaching with blood streaming down his face. It did have a dramatic effect, I might say. But uh, they would sometimes take bulls and run them into these outdoor meetings and try to disperse the crowd. They would set up little bands, you know, and uh, they'd play music so loud that you couldn't even hear uh, Wesley's voice over the sound of that. All of that was accompanied by attacks in the press which uh, called Wesley choice little things like that Methodist, that enthusiast, that mystery of iniquity, that diabolical seducer, that imposter, that fanatic, and other complimentary terms. You know, this is the kind of thing that Wesley was dealing with over the years as time went on, and yet he, to his credit, never met that kind of abuse with, with similar uh, reaction. He was always gracious. He was always forgiving. He preached first and foremost the need for Christian conversion. He preached the need to come to faith in Christ for real. My assumption is that every one of you in this room has come to faith in Christ for real, but I would be irresponsible to just take that for granted. So I have to say to you what John Wesley would say to you right now, that that is always something to go back and check and recheck. Have you really come to faith in Christ for real? That was the first thing that Wesley preached. That will change the course of history. When people come to faith in Christ for real, lives change, history changes. And that was really, in many ways, part of what happened here. Vishal Mangalwadi, whose name some of you may know, wrote extensively on the life of John Wesley. He's from India, but he was impressed with this, and he wrote in a book, especially one I recommend, entitled The Book That Made Your World. So make a note of that if you ever want to have a good read. Uh, and anyway, he says of this impact that Wesley had, sailors, uh, soldiers, miners, fishermen, smugglers, Industrial workers, thieves, vagabonds, men, women, children listened intently in apt, reverent attention, gradually removed their hats and knelt, often emotionally overcome, as he pointed these thousands upon thousands to God's grace. More than, for more than 50 years, Wesley fed the Bible to drink, sodden, brutalized, and neglected multitudes. Wesley, however, was also about more than just Christian conversion. As important and central as that was, he also said to be a true, deep uh, a Christian, you've got to have a good education. He would have been a cheerleader for the Oaks like you wouldn't believe because he thinks what you're getting here is essential to being effective and, and useful as a Christian person. And so he, the, the preachers that preached in his organization were required also to have books that they sold at very low prices to people because Wesley said unless you were a person of learning, unless you have an education, then it really limits the effectiveness to which you can be put in God's work. Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, which usually is no great fan of Christians, nevertheless says of John Wesley, quote, no man in the 18th century did so much to create a taste for good reading and to supply it with books 
at the lowest prices. He emphasized practical, uh, ethical theory in his preaching. One of the little book uh, that he wrote was entitled Rules for a Helper, in which he said things like this, never be unemployed for a moment. Believe evil of no one. Speak evil of no one. A preacher of the gospel is a servant of all. Be ashamed of nothing but sin. Be punctual. That's worth the price of admission right there. You'll need all the common sense you have to have your wits about you. There was no public figure in England at the time who knew the state of the life of the poor better than John Wesley or did more about it. But the most dramatic attack launched by John Wesley was against the institutional slavery that was the backbone of the English economy, and this made him some serious enemies. He published a little book entitled Thoughts on Slavery. The thesis for the book was Genesis 4.10. And the Lord said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. This book was written 13 years before the English Abolition Committee that was largely responsible for getting slave trade outlawed in England in 1807. This was the first shot across the bow and it wasn't a politician, it was a preacher who launched this attack against that horrific trade. It was impolite, it was embarrassing, it made him very unpopular. He called it a horrid trade, he called it a national disgrace. Footnote, I think if John Wesley were working in America today, he would have some things to say about a national disgrace and a horrid trade. It wouldn't be slavery, it would be abortion, and it would embarrass some polite Christians because he would be so vicious in attacking that that a lot of people who actually agreed with him would be terrified at his rhetoric. But that's what it took and that's what it takes. It takes courage and it takes a willingness not to worry about how popular you are at a given moment in history. Well. He continued that diatribe against slavery and the institution of slavery right to his last day. The last letter we know of he wrote was to William Wilberforce, who was, of course, the member of parliament chiefly responsible for the Slave Trade Act that outlawed slavery. He attacked the, uh, uh, the British uh, resistance to the colonial revolutionary war. He thought it was, he called it stupid that the British, he said the British should come home and uh, leave uh, those folks alone over there. He attacked the criminal justice system, but he also had some very positive things to do. He and his brother Charles wrote thousands of hymns that became really some of the mainstays of the Christian movement from that point on. Every one of you in this room, I assume, has sung the hymn, uh, uh, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? You know that and many, many other hymns, many of them set to the popular tunes of the day in which, in a sense, He restored the soul of England. He put the Bible back at the center of the culture as what was regarded then as the book of books. And the impact in English history is virtually incalculable. I can't even begin to tell you how deeply it reversed what seemed to be a freight train heading down a path to a very bad place. It transformed the ministry of the church, some of the greatest preachers produced in Christian history, came in the wake of that great awakening. Charles Spurgeon in England, D.L. Moody, many, many others, both in England and America. The politics, the Slave Trade Act I've mentioned. Uh, Wesley, John Newton was converted largely through the influence of John Wesley, wrote Amazing Grace, you know, William Wilberforce. Literature was transformed. Some of you in this room are taking Brit Litt. There would be no course called Brit Lit, none, had it not been for John Wesley. Simple as that. He created the context within which that literature could be generated. You would never have names like Charles Dickens, 
Sir Walter Scott, Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, Robert Louis Stevenson, William Blake, Robert Browning, Lord Tennyson. Not that those people were all Bible-banging fundamentalists, don't get me wrong, but they couldn't even write that literature unless it was against a backdrop of a Christian worldview. It took that to make that literature meaningful. Where in the world does a book like the, a story like The Christmas Carol come from, from Charles Dickens, unless you've got some sort of substructure to the culture that is informed by a profoundly Christian view of things. And the influences go on and on. He transformed labor, he transformed education, the so-called modern missionary effort, usually attributed to William Carey in the first instance, the father of it, was driven by this Great Awakening. Carey himself was deeply influenced by John Wesley. He was also influenced by Jonathan Edwards and his publication of the journal of David Brainerd. And uh, as a result of that, he went to India, one of the early missionaries to India. He's celebrated to this day as a national hero in India. There's a stamp still around that celebrates the career of William Carey in India. Other organizations were, were just uh, uh, exploded out of the influence of Wesley and the Great Awakening, including the Salvation Army, the Religious Tract Society, the Pastoral Aid Society, the London City Mission, Mueller's Homes, Orphanages, Agnes Weston, Sailors and Soldiers Rest, the YMCA came out of that movement, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Guides as they were called at that time, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals came out of the influence of the Great Awakening and the contribution of John Wesley. He convinced Christian people of something that they have often lost sight of, that the Christian message is a message of hope, a message of God's kingdom expanding and growing, not withering and not dying. And so, whether it was Marxist ideology or a kind of defeatist attitude among Christians, he repudiated that by the effect of his career. The impact of the preaching of John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and eventually many others, I tell you, boggles the imagination. He died at 88. He died unquestionably the most beloved and respected figure in England. They had portraits of him in every church and in every pub. They had beer mugs with his picture on them because he was so popular, he was so widely appreciated, and it was viewed generally at the time that he had rescued England from the brink and pulled her back. So the 18th century, the 1700s, were left behind in English history as the most embarrassing and corrupt, England entered the 19th century, the 1800s, arguably the, the, the nation that had the most glorious reputation of any in the world up till that time in human history. Sometimes people look back on that era of English history and they can be a little bit uh, dismissive of it, but at the time, it was viewed as the center of the universe by people whether they lived in England or not. So, France had no Great Awakening. France had no John Wesley. France had no one to interrupt the train it was on producing a guy who called himself the king of the world. France had nothing to prevent that. But at the very same time that France was heading down that path, England the grace of God was heading down a very different path. So there was a battle of Waterloo, and there were two guys who won, who lost. Well, I, for my money, I'm going to go with John Wesley. I think John Wesley won the day. Uh, but uh, I think I'd have to say in connection with that what I'm sure John Wesley would say, that the guy that really won the day was the Lord Jesus Christ, working through a humble servant. And that happened to be John Wesley then. I don't know who it might be today, but I suspect that person may be in this room. And so I want to close by saying a comment, first of all, to you faculty. Students, you can sleep for 15 seconds. You know, I've been where you are. I've been here. I've loved those years that I had at the Oaks, and now I'm living the life of retirement, and I dig it. Let me just say that to you guys first of all.
But more importantly, the day-to-day -day job of being a teacher, cranking out lesson plans, figuring out how you're going to try to keep students half awake, you know, during class. The, I understand that, but please never, ever forget, never lose sight of the fact you may have in your class right now the next John Wesley. You may have the next Jonathan Edwards. And so you who are faculty, come to class every day with some little spark of hope that you are molding a life that could change the course of history. I guarantee nobody who was educating John Wesley when he was 10 years old would have imagined in a thousand years that he's a guy we'd be talking about hundreds of years later. But that's what God had in mind. And what a privilege it would turn out to be to have had an influence in their lives. Okay, students, you wake up now. Because you, my friends, may be the next John Wesley. Boy or girl, male or female, I don't care. It doesn't matter. You can have an impact that would be beyond your most wild imaginations if you're prepared to give yourself unreservedly, as John Wesley did, to the cause of Christ in this world and meet the most evident needs of this world in that name. There's nothing that can stop the power of God at work in even one life. And I think the reason we had a battle of Waterloo to highlight the difference between two cultures was just to remind us that Jesus has not resigned from being king of the universe. Thank you very much, Napoleon. And he's not going to resign. And that you are always in the best company when you are in service to him. Thank you. Thank you.